Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's video, I'm going to let you know about tonight's author. Dr. Plague, or Erucius, has a book available now on Amazon. This is actually the fifth compilation of short stories that they have available on Amazon, and I'll have a link to all five of them in the description down below. If you guys love horror stories, or if you've loved any of the stories you've heard from Erucius before, I strongly suggest you check these out. You don't want to miss out on any of the really good ones I haven't had the chance to put in here yet. And speaking of stories from Erucius, on to tonight's story. I heard he was mute, and the clapping is how he communicates. I heard he's a ghost. The clapping is how he gets your attention. I heard you were both big old babies who would believe in anything. Daryl and Gary looked up incredulously at me as I grinned back at them from across the lunch table. Oh yeah, well, he's been linked to the disappearance of like four kids now, so it sounds like a pretty good reason to be afraid of him, Daryl said, sounding mad. I just shrugged at him, popping a french fry in my mouth and savoring the salt. There's no proof that this clapping man is responsible for a candy bar going missing at Dell's, let alone Mickey Fraser getting snatched. The clapping man story was something that had been circulating for a while. Three younger kids had gone missing first, all of them heading home from somewhere or another, and some of the witnesses had reported hearing a clapping sound before they had gone missing. One of them had even reported seeing a man-sized shape in the woods before hearing the clap. They didn't have any details about the guy, but they said that it looked like a person's shadow with long arms. Mickey had been the most recent disappearance, and the one that made the cops around Tiger the most nervous. The first three had been younger kids, elementary school kids, who hadn't looked like much, but Mickey had been a 17-year-old farm kid who was built like a linebacker. The story was that he was trying to find one of his dad's missing sheep around dusk, and he'd just never come back. The stories were that he was near a Kindle-covered bridge, and that the sheep had been found dead underneath it the next day. There were the usual rumors that Mickey had run off or left to be with a girl, left to be with a boy for all they knew. But those of us who had known Mickey kind of doubted it. Mickey was slow. I mean, not like special ed slow, but he was slower than average. He loved his family. He loved working on his parents' farm. And the thought that he would just run off when he couldn't come back with his sheep was laughable. Mickey liked football, too, but if his dad had asked, he'd have given it up in a heartbeat. The cops knew this, too, and that's why they were so sure that Mickey had been taken by someone, and, and that someone had to be big. The bell rang, and we kept our seats as the good little sheep dispersed around us. We'd leave when the monitor finally told us that we had to, not a minute before. Gary still looked a little nervous as the cafeteria cleared out, but Daryl was pretty used to this. Daryl and me had been hellion since we were young, but it was a life that Gary was slowly getting used to. I'm not a bad kid. I mean, not really. I loved my mama, I respected my dad. I kept my truck well maintained, and I'm good to my girl when I have one. And that being said, I have no time for weakness or rules. The only rule I know is that the strong rule, and it's a rule that I learned from my dad. If I'm strong, and I am, I should be able to do what I want. If other kids don't understand that, well, that's their problem. Just like when I push them down and show them who's boss. Daryl, Gary, and me never really considered ourselves a gang or anything, but... We pal around because we all believe that when you're strong, you're right. Mrs. Gladdy looked our way, and I grinned at her as I waved. Mrs. Gladdy's cute, and she ain't strong. She teaches home ec, and she drives a spark. Nothing about that says strong. She'd come over before and tried to talk nice to us to get us back on the straight and narrow, but I mean, never did any good. Eventually, she stopped trying, and when she turned and called to Mr. Gersh... The shop teacher, we took our feet off the table and started heading to class. Now Gersh was strong. An eight-year combat vet with scars to prove it. He was not to be messed with. We were halfway to class when the bell rang from the start of fifth period, and I looked at the boys and told them I thought maybe we should take the rest of the day off. I gotta get to math, Gary said. If I don't keep at least a C, they'll kick me off the football team. Same, Daryl said with a sigh. If I don't pass that history test today, my mom says I can't run the roads this weekend. 
Come on, man. Just come to class with us. The beers will still be there after school. I blew a big old raspberry at them and told them if they wanted to be pansies, then I'd go drink it all up before they got there. They begged me not to go, but I was done for the day. School had never really held any appeal for me. I already figured I'd drop out at the end of the year, go into hauling lumber like my uncle, or into farming like my dad. I was too dumb for the army, too lazy for college, but at least I figured it out a year before anyone else did. Have fun with math class then, I said, waving as I walked to the parking lot to get to my truck. The little Ford Ranger that Dad had given me wasn't much, but it was fine for now. I really wanted to get one of those big F-350s like my uncle had, but I'd either have to save up a bunch of money or steal one to have something that nice. The Ranger was fine for now, and I slunk out of the lot in low gear before turning and flying up the road for home. The dirt roads of Tiger were like a second home to me. I put the schoolhouse behind me. I thought again about just leaving in one of them for parts unknown. And what was there really here for me? A dead-end job, a nagging wife, squalling kids and a mortgage I couldn't pay, a bottle of beer after work with the boys, a loveless marriage that would hang like a shackle around my neck, maybe a trip to Stragview if I wasn't careful, or a telephone pole in the night if I had one too many beers. I didn't like to think too much about the future then preferring to live in the moment. And this particular moment was about to contain a 12-pack of beer. I pulled in behind the barn so that Dad wouldn't see me if he came home early. Dad was at the farmer's market till around four selling his wares, and I figured he wouldn't be the wiser of me cutting school. I walked off into the field of peanuts, this year's crop, and into the woods beyond. I had been exploring the woods before I was potty trained. The spot I knew of was about a mile back in an old tangle of trees. Daryl and me had found it when we were still small enough to squeeze between the roots of the snacky trees and make a clubhouse down there. And it now served as a spot for us to drink and smoke and bring girls for a little privacy. The forest was familiar, an old friend that protected me sometimes when Dad had a little too much to drink. And before I knew it, I could see the old grove of trees in the distance. Most of the forest was thick old oaks and some scraggly little pup trees. But the grove was different. It was old. It felt ancient, somehow. And being there made me feel peaceful, like nothing could hurt me while I was there. I got to the snacky trees and took a seat on the comfy old roots that stuck above ground. Reaching into the gnarled old root system and pulling out the 12-pack of Budweiser, I cracked the first can and drank it quickly, smacking my lips as the crisp taste filled my stomach. This was the good life right here, but I knew it wouldn't last forever. I'd have to trade this kind of carefree time for adulthood soon enough, and the thought of saying goodbye to the snaky tree grove was a little sad. I opened the second one, drinking it slower this time, and the wind rustled the leaves around me. I felt a yawn creeping up my throat. Dad and me had been splitting wood before school today, and the early morning and the lukewarm beer was starting to make me groggy. As the second one disappeared and the third one popped open, I got comfy and watched the dragonflies and little forest animals frolic in the bow of the trees. I felt at ease, like I was floating. When the beer can slipped out of my hand and fell into the nest of roots, I was snoring before it dumped its delicious contents on the ground. When I woke up, it was dark. The sound of birds and squirrels had been replaced with insects and a scamper of bats. This didn't immediately put me off. I had been in the woods at night before. Daryl and me had camped out tons of times. I had even slept rough a time or two if Mom and Dad were fighting. I pulled myself out of the tangle of roots and wobbled a little before getting my bearings. I wasn't drunk, not by a long shot, or hungover. I had taken a long nap in the woods, and now it was time to get home and face the music. School would have called by now and told them I left early. Dad would be looking for me during evening chores, and not found me. These things would have culminated in him having a drink as he waited for me, as I was likely in for a bad time. I walked out of the grove, watching my step as I went. And that was when I first heard it. A loud pop sound that made me freeze in place and listen like a spooked deer. 
I stopped for a count of five, waiting for it to come again so I could identify it, but all I heard was the quiet sounds of the evening woods. I started walking again, but after five more steps, I heard the loud pop again. I thought that it might be a tree branch cracking at first, but now it sounded more like like something familiar. It wasn't a natural sound, not like a branch breaking or or rocks bumping as they fell. It was a sound I hadn't really heard out here before. Uh, A sound I was familiar with, but seemed alien out here. It sounded like... like someone bringing their hands together for a single hard clap. I kept walking towards the house, thinking I was hearing things, but the longer I went, the more I heard the clapping sound. It was infrequent. Always that one loud pop. And when I looked, there was nothing I could find that would have made it. The longer I walked, the more freaked out I got at the popping. I found myself looking for a man's shape in the woods. Thinking about what the kids had told the cops. It was big, like someone's shadow standing in the woods. Its arms were longer than usual. And they had heard a loud clapping sound before their friends had disappeared. I stopped again. It had been closer this time. It sounded like it was about 20 feet away, and the clap it, it had silenced a bunch of the forest creatures that had been buzzing placidly. I wanted to run, but I, I made myself walk so I didn't trip in a hole or uh, knock myself unconscious on a low-hanging branch. There was also the fact that these were my woods. I mean, Nothing bad could happen to me in my woods. No one could hurt me. No one would would dare to. Now it was closer. Ten feet or better. It was following me, and I was still a half mile from home. I wondered how far it would let me get before it snatched me. Would they find any evidence that I had been alive? Would they ever find anything? They quickened my pace. Holes be damned, I needed to go. I needed to get out of here. I needed to be behind my door with a a lock thrown and the bolt pushed in. I'd hug my dad, I'd tell him I was sorry, I'd take whatever punishment came, but I needed to know that the monster or freak or whatever was outside and couldn't get me. I ducked a branch that I saw as a vague outline and I kept moving. The popping had stopped for now, but I knew that I wasn't safe. I had to get home. I, I had to get home. I had to get... I turned my head in the direction of the sound. And there he was. He was man-shaped, that was for sure. He looked like a bulky man, his arms and legs just thick outlines in the murk. I couldn't see his eyes, but I could feel them on me. He didn't make a sound, but the longer I stayed still, the more I began to hear a low murmur like a TV show trying to break through the static. I thought that he might be frozen by my stare, but but as I watched, he raised his hands slowly and brought them together with a single hard clap. I took off like a shot. I ran and I ran and I ran as the popping followed me. I expected that every step would be my last. A claw would come out or a set of teeth would clamp down on me and I'd be dragged away to whatever served as its den for digestion or God knows what else. The popping started coming from directly behind me and I could almost feel the air off those massive hands. I could see lights coming up into view ahead and I I thought maybe I had gotten turned around and I'd I'd find a highway. I didn't care. I just wanted, wanted someone to help me escape this creature and I wasn't choosy as to about who. I broke through the tree line to discover that I'd come out on the edge of my parents' farm, and the lights were flashlights as people looked for me. They were calling my name as they got closer to the woods, and I tore off towards the fields in an attempt to stop them from entering. One of them could have just as easily been that thing's next meal, and I wasn't about to draw them to it. I found Dad first, and his beam turned to fix me, and he wrapped me in a hug as he recognized me. God damn, boy, I was so scared that he'd been took. He hugged me. Close. The first time I'd ever seen my dad show that kind of emotion. And when he called out to them, he he found me. I I saw them all start to head to his location. The police came. They they talked to me. 
I don't know if they took me seriously or not, but told people to stay out of the woods for a while and to listen for clapping if they were alone. Mickey was the last kid to go missing in the tiger that year. And when the clapping had come back after that, he seemed better prepared for it. That experience changed me. I'm glad to say it was for the better. I started taking my schooling a little more seriously. I stopped being so impetuous. I started helping people instead of taking. Changed my way of thinking a lot. I still believe that strong people are important, but now I believe that they have a responsibility to keep those who aren't strong safe. I started volunteering to go out on woodland rescues. Searching for people who'd gotten lost or looking for remains. I got approached by the park service to see if I wanted to work with them. Now I help educate people so they don't get lost. And I help find those who go missing. In a way, I guess I owe the clapping man a debt. He saved me that night from becoming a monster, too. Although... I really doubt that was his intention. For those of you guys that like to listen to stories, which I assume is all of you since, you know, you're here, check out The Chilling App. I keep saying The Chilling App, and you can start your free trial, blah, 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 over the past couple of year, years, I think, two years? Well, here's some amazing news for all of you. Chilling is currently introducing Chilling 2.0, which brings in a bunch of new features and a fresh new look. Most importantly, Chilling is now free. That's correct, free. Not as in start free trial. I'm saying it's free. You can go to it now and it's free. So once again, like I said, start listening free today. There's links in the description down below if you guys can check that out. And if not, then hey, you're the one who's missing out. Once again, that's the Chilling app. A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Dana Krause, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kyle Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canazales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Buddy Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Crownable, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Arias, Estebean, Nick Cole, Our Minsect Time, Xyla Bones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Levita Galvin, That Creepy Check, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Paralinium, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ica Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Pike Mount, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Sashi Sasaku, Crokinut 509, Stricket, Ready Kruger, Lisa Cottrell, Katie's nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiwi the Sloth, Master's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below, and thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming. 